Okay, um, so uh, this is the second uh, set of three uh, lectures. Um, in this lecture, I'm going to be uh, talking less about the kind of basic theory of ILP, possibly less about the basic theory of meta-interpretive learning, and more about particular issues which come up when you try to apply this in real uh, settings. Um, and uh, so we're going to be exploring a notion called bias reformulation. Uh, the paper for this lecture, uh, which again is on the website that I put up at the beginning, is this one which appeared in the European Conference on AI. It was a collaboration between my group and Josh Tenenbaum's group at, uh, at MIT. Um, and it was, um, so the inspiration for it uh, came from a presentation at a Dachstuhl seminar uh, that uh, we both attended. Um, on uh, a system called FlashFill being was uh, developed by Microsoft, um, and I think is the at the time was the was the first mass market product uh, associated with program induction, uh, which is what the seminar was about. Um, so uh, you'll see this term one shot function induction, which was the thing that really caught my eye and Josh's. Okay, I'm going to start by asking you to look at a standard kind of IQ test thing that you've probably seen before, textual analogy problem. So we have um, a word here, B-O-B, lowercase, another word here, B-O-B. And this is supposed to say Bob goes to Bob as Alice goes to question mark uh, something else, okay? And uh, so pretty much uh, everybody... Uh, can can get this one. Um, so I now say, uh, is this the que is this the answer? Right? Anybody want to vote for this as the answer? Why not? Because I can tell you that just as there is a program which turns that word into that word by using uppercase characters, by uppercasing all of the initial characters, there is a program that takes that word to that one. Can anybody tell me what that program does? Oh, very good, very good, yeah. So it takes the first two letters, in this case, always puts B-O, just like it did there, and then the rest, it takes the, the end of the string and uppercases it, okay? So why didn't everybody jump to that conclusion, right? because I suspect everybody jumped to the idea that this would be uppercase Alice here, right? Well, I would argue that when we face this problem as an IQ problem, we've already looked at a lot of text in the past, and we've got a very strong bias as to what we think is the case, okay? If you treat this as a problem of machine learning, we've been given just one example of what happens as you take Bob to Bob, and we're supposed to now know what would happen with every other example, okay? Um, but if you think about that in terms of machine learning, that's extremely hard to do. How could, how could you machine learn just from one example? Um, typically, machine learning algorithms, you know, if you're using a neural net, you have to have tens of thousands of examples in order to get anywhere. Here, people seem quite happy to do this every time with one example, right? This is all of these, these analogy problems are like that. So how do we do that? Um, I think we've got a very strong bias, okay? Now here are other variants of this, okay? So imagine you have this, task one goes that string to that one, this one here goes that string to this one, task three is this one to that one. And um, what was interesting is that uh, the presentation we saw of the Microsoft uh, add-on to, to Excel from 2013 was able to handle problems like this. You would type in one example like this, and you'd say, this goes to that, and then it would fill in columns on the spreadsheet and get them right almost every single time. And we were astonished that this was actually possible. When uh, Sumit Gulwani explained what they'd done, 
it was quite clear that it wasn't so easy for them to get it to do that. It took something uh, close on six months of uh, a group of 30 programmers to get the bias honed well enough from examples that they'd got from users in order to be able to do this. So what, we, what I was curious about uh, at, after that was, could we actually learn that bias? Could we actually learn to do a kind of general bias of that kind by looking at lots of example types like this and, and zeroing in on a strong bias that once we'd got it, it was sufficient to learn from one example? A very weird thing to try and do, but it seemed uh, worth doing it. Another way of thinking a bit about this is, could you learn this human text transformation bias? Could you get a computer to learn to act like a computer, like a, like a, a, a human in terms of text transformation? Right, so this is the thing that, that amazed us. We looked, this is from Gorwani's papers, uh, Popple papers back in 2011 and 12. Uh, involving FlashFill, the FlashFill system. Uh, this is the one that he showed us. Um, so you've got all these email addresses, brent.harold at hotmail.com, and then it says that has to be transformed into that. And then once you've given that one example, so the, the user types in that, that Brent Harold on the right, the uh, FlashFill in a flash fills the rest out like this, okay? And in the process, it's looked at, I don't know how many, he gave astonishing figures of numbers of different programs that had been considered. Uh, and it comes out with one that does all of these. So it'll always somehow turn this thing into Matthew Rossman and so on. Um, so uh, having seen that, we thought, well, we'll have to beat that uh, within a short period. So we'll use meta-interpretive learning to do this, okay? Um, so it sounds impossible, and uh, Josh's RA said it would be impossible, uh, but we tried to do it. Um, one of the things which uh, encouraged me when, they, when the group tried to build up sets of examples was that FlashFill often made very weird errors, or sometimes made very weird errors. So they made up some, some, some unusual examples, and this one here takes Ian Rodney and this is the example given, and this is the test example, Stanley Travis turns into I Tanley really Travis, okay? And this, that's, if you remember the one, the bow ice one that I had earlier, this is exactly that. It's found some crazy way of doing the transformation. And if you look at this for long enough, we stared at it to try and find out what the program must be, and at last figured it out. If you want to bother, then uh, try it, but there actually is a program in their space which does this weird transformation. Okay, so we want to do better than that, right? So uh, in, our, uh, in our approach, what we did is we built uh, a, some background knowledge involving various different primitive transform transformers, things like skip rest, copy word, and so on. And then we gave examples, actually just one example at a time. And here's one of those that's taken from the previous slides, brent.harold at hotmail.com. This is all a, uh, a, a list given in Prolog. And this list is the output. Uh, everything in the list is an individual character. Then these lists have to be treated as pairs. And we give this as one of the target programs to be learned, which uh, in our set of examples. We had lots of different types. This was, uh, this was problem number four. And um, after nine seconds of considering this problem, uh, Metagol pops out this answer here, which um, is a dyadic program of the kind that I've shown you before. It has lots of invented predicates. It's a little bit hard to follow, right? But once you get the gist of it, you can actually see the structure, right? At the top level, it breaks this problem of the transformation into two subproblems, 4.1 and 4.2. In 4.1, it again breaks the problem into two subproblems, 4.3 and 4.4. And then uh, at 4.2, uh, it does a 4.3 with a skip rest, and 4.3 make copyright. So what's it doing? OK. So follow it down. 4.1. What does 4.1 do? It does this thing. Uh, 4.3 and 4.4, four, four, 
that does a make uppercase. So take that, that lowercase b there, make it uppercase, and then it copies the word. So that's R-E-N-T until the dot. It copies that to the output. Um, it then goes back and it needs to do a 4-4, four, four, which it says skip one. So it skips the dot, right? And then it writes a space on the output, the space there. And now it's finished, okay? So it's actually done for one. It's got Brent uh, space, okay? That's the first half of what it did. So the next one, for two, and you go through and you can actually figure out, it reuses for two, uh, this for three guy here. And for three does a make up a case again to take H to Harold, and then a copy word to get the A-R-O-L-D until the at. And then it, it's finished and at the end, it skips the remainder of the output, okay? So there is actually uh, an interesting program under here, which involves decomposition, right? It's a little program that it's figured out. It took it nine seconds of computation, which actually is a, quite a, is a very long time for uh, Metagol to do, and it's only treating one example to do that. But it gets something which actually correctly does this in the same way as, as uh, the flash fill does on all similar out input outputs of the kind that it was given. So it's correct. Okay, <clears throat> now, we tr now when trying this out, we had, a whole, we had 17 different tasks. And at one stage, for some reason, we looked at sequencing these tasks and something odd happened, right? So we did a... We, one of the tasks was this top one, to transform lowercase James to uppercase James with a full stop at the end, and then EP04. We just did EP02 and then EP04, one after another, and got an odd result, which was, whereas it had taken us nine seconds to find an EP04 solution, it now took us three seconds, okay? But it's three seconds to learn both the tasks. How can that be? How can it take less time to learn two solutions on separate tasks than to learn just one? Well, it, it's, it doesn't make any sense. So we tried it the other way around, learn zero, 04 and then zero, 02, and it didn't happen, right? It was more than nine seconds in that case. So why in this case is it so much shorter? Well, it turns out that in, invent, in doing this first one, it invents EP021 in the, for the first task, which is then used twice in the construct of EP04, which means EP04 has a definition which is one clause shorter than it was here. Here it had five clauses. Here it's only got four clauses, right? So by having this little library where it, it's, it finds things that are useful, when they become reused, it massively reduces the time for the learning. So we thought, ah, oh, great, but it may just be one of these lucky things that happen in that, just that case. So we decided we were gonna do that a bit more, uh, more systematically. First of all, though, we wanted to try and understand these complexity results, so, so what the complexity advantages were. So we worked out what the combinatorics of the space were, and if you take uh, the, uh, so M as being the number of meta rules, N as the number of clauses in the target definition, P as the number of predicate symbols, then the time taken in order to, or the space size, if you considered all of, the, all of the hypotheses, is order MN P3N, okay? Uh, the three there is to do with, with H22, right? It's, it's to do with finding uh, three predicate symbols in a, in a dyadic H22 uh, clause. Um, so, what is it that's wh wh what is it in this uh, in this formula that uh, is uh, the killer in terms of of uh, the size of the search? Well, it's n, right? It's the number of clauses. So the search increases exponentially in terms of the number of clauses. So. Whatever, we, whatever strategy we apply, we'd like it to end up searching smaller number of clauses. And precisely in the case that we looked at, this is what made a big reduction in the amount of time taken. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells you that by reordering the set of predicates, if, you if, you're, learning, if you're doing a multi, 
um, task learning problem, which we were, then there may be a good ordering in which to do it, which reduces the overall amount of search and correspondingly improves the out-of-sample error. So we tried this idea by uh, using a particular strategy. So the strategy involves you start off by considering all 17 different tasks and you apply a constraint. You say, find me solutions in which you can express the solution in only one clause, right? And it considers all of the different hypotheses, all of the different tasks. It turns out there are only two of the tasks we had, 14 and 16, which had a one clause solution. But having found the one clause solution, you're now allowed to reuse the definition and any invented predicate. So, uh, now, in the next round, you're allowed up to two clauses, okay? It turns out that in one of those cases, you've got two and 15. In one of those cases, it's able to reuse 15. Task 15 is able to reuse the definition 16, right? So there's a little bit of a space saved there. There's a little bit of a, of a time space. But at the next level up, when you're allowed to, you're learning from three, uh, you're allowed up to three clauses, you suddenly find that 15 is introduced for something really significant that's able to be used by lots of other things, okay? So it turns out that all of this reuse starts to, to grow rapidly. That's what's happening here in what we're calling dependent learning. In independent learning, no reuse is allowed, right? You just have to learn everything independently. So here, 14 and 16 are learned. Here you could learn two, but you couldn't learn 15, which you could only have learned if you had reused 16, and so on up. So by the time that you get up to timeout, in independent learning, there are still four tasks which are uh, unlearnable, unlearnable in the number of clauses. But with the dependent learning, only task nine can no, cannot actually be defined because you've introduced all sorts of useful redefinable predicates in the process. Okay, so looking at this uh, graph here, this dependency graph, in fact, it's a calling diagram, right? So three is calling something of 12, or maybe an inventor predicate of 12, and that's calling an inventor predicate of 17, 15 down to 16. So there's quite a lot of dependency. It's quite a deep program that's being learned. And this is a slice through that program, okay? So that is three up there, okay? It's calling 12.1 and 12 itself. And then 12 is calling 12.1 and 12.2, 12.1, et cetera. All the way down here, right? So if you look at that as a prologue program, you're producing something that's not very dissimilar from deep learning, except this is being done in logic. The search space, so the, the definition is too big. We, we just set a, a timeout. Uh, the timeout we set as being six. Okay, so, so you, were, you were, no, sorry, the time, it's beyond five. So when you go to five, actually it's taking quite a long time to do the learning, right, because of the exponential increase in the search time. So at that point, if you've looked at five, you've covered, in this case, all of them. Uh, and only nine is left out. All of those are timing out, 17, four, nine, and five, okay? Only nine is timing out here, right? Because the definitions are too big, even after you've introduced all of these extra predicates that could be used for defining it. But when you look at this, you see, not only is this very similar in the, in the way that deep learning builds one layer on top of another, um, it also uh, has one of the problems of deep learning, which is it's impossible to read the program now, right? It's really hard work to see. This is only a bit of the program. It's really hard work to interpret what 12.1 uh, or 12.3 are. Uh, uh, in fact, though, you have a slight advantage because if you work through it systematically, you could give a name, a sensible name to 15.1. Uh, skip alpha num, skip one, and substitute that name into here and work your way through it and end up with a readable program. Okay, so we have some of the upsides and the downsides of, of deep learning in a even in a logical setting. 
In terms of performance, what, what happened that was interesting is that uh, the independent learner was uh, uh, tested both allowing recursion and non-recursive definitions. And throughout, independent learning uh, solved fewer tasks and had higher error. In the comparisons that uh, were done uh, by Josh's group against human beings, we find that human beings have, even after ciphering, have a slightly higher performance uh, than our learning had achieved, but not very different from flash fills, right? Flash fill appeared to be very good until you ciphered the inputs, and then it looks very much like a human uh, learner. But if you notice that we were bound by 17 tasks that we'd extracted from the Gulwani papers, we're still heading up. So given more tasks, we may well have reached that bound uh, that both uh, Flashville and the humans seem to have. So we are progressively learning the, quotes human-like bias, but not quite to human levels in this experiment. Um, if we look at the, at the times involved, and, uh, according to log scales, you can see, though, that we're making um, exponential savings in terms of the time when we look at the difference between independent and dependent learning, which is, as you would expect, according to the, um, to the complexity uh, bounds that we had introduced to begin with, because we're systematically reducing the numbers of clauses needed in order to build the definitions, and that will lead to an exponential speed up. It also reduces the error throughout. So, um, as a summary, um, what we were looking at here is multitask learning. We restricted the learning to always being from one example, okay? All of the learning I've shown you the programs were learned from single examples in the same way as Flashfill had been demonstrated to do. As you learn from those single examples, your competence on other single example given learning tasks increases. So it shows you a rather interesting strategy. Rather than having lots of examples in just one task, why not have one example in lots of tasks, okay? It's a completely different way of learning, but something that's much, uh, it's much more familiar uh, from a kind of cognitive perspective. People don't learn from millions of examples, but they do learn lots of things simultaneously. The uh, use of predicate invention um, and learning recursion both paid off here. Um, predicate invention particularly because it populates the space of string transformations with useful new um, uh, uh, predicates that are reused within this context. Um, then uh, you have, uh, here, you also have a, a, a kind of complete uh, way of doing, uh, or a, 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 an approach to inductive programming that is simple and compact and not demanding on the programmer, right? So you're only asking for a single example in each case, um, which is, again, one of the aspects that's built into Flashfill because it's designed for naive programmers. People are actually writing programs. They just don't know that that's what they're doing. They're typing in, you know, Brent Harold or whatever, but what's happening underneath the boot is they're generating a more and more complex program. Um, so there's a, there's a, there are ideas there that could be used in intelligent interfaces for programming, um, and, uh, but we're short of a number of different uh, strengths that we could have had. Some of the problems that we looked at would, could really help, uh, it, could, it could really help having more general transformations. If you think about string transformation as a general class of, of programming, in fact, it's Turing complete, right? If I say I can give you any string as the input and any string as the output, Clearly, I could introduce a sorting program in there, right? So I, my input string is uh, 32895, and the, the output is the sorted version of the same. And again, we didn't, at this point, have a way of handling noisy examples, and it was unclear what noise meant in the case of learning from one example. 
So these were these are all kind of interesting things that came out of it, and I would claim that going not just looking at the theory of this, but actually working through real examples that people are trying at Microsoft and so on actually had an advantage in making us think harder about the theory of what's going on and what we could do to make that to improve that. So, um, any questions? Something like this, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if there are ways you could additionally impose extra constraints on the, the time complexity of the program to say that it, it must complete this operation in fewer than 20 steps or, um, or like relative to the length of the human text. Uh, so it's a very good point, and it's something which we followed up um, in the following year at Ichikai, uh, in which we had a paper, uh, Andrew Cropper and I wrote a paper on how to learn uh, uh, program, uh, how to learn efficient programs. Okay, uh, and we had two different models of that. One of which we had primitives like this, but each one of them had a resource being consumed. So within the definition, it says. Every time you do this, you push a button and it, a counter goes up, okay? And so when evaluating the solutions, you evaluated the cost of, of, uh, of, of them. And the search that we did, first of all, started by finding the, the smallest program that you could, and then allowed you to search larger spaces where you had non-minimal size programs, but with lower uh, overall resource cost, okay? So, so that's a that's a really we didn't we weren't looking at that at this stage, but it has been looked at since then, um, and we've got some quite nice results about the degree of optimality that you can achieve in learning efficient programs, time efficient programs, including learning quicksort, where you have to do all the predicate invention and stuff. Hi. We disallowed, sorry? We, we didn't allow to have more than five clauses in a definition of a predicate. Well, we went up to five clauses, and the reason we didn't go beyond there is that um, it was taking a silly amount of time. We couldn't complete the experiment, okay? But the interesting thing is, so we could have set it at four, and we would have still found that um, the dependent learner was doing better. Um, five was the outer limit of what we could bear to, to take time in, in, the, in doing. So here, even at four, it's leaving out just three and nine, right? Whereas over here, it's leaving out three, 13, 11, 17, four, nine, and five. Yeah, so one, one could give it more running time, but it, eventually it's... And what was the, the nice example about why you can't say the password for the integration? Ah, good question. I'd have to look back at the data set. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, some of them, some of the problems that had been introduced weren't actually, so they were ones that the MIT group had just decided would be interesting, like reversing a list or something like that. Um, and it may have been one of those, I can't remember. Uh, but I could, I could check back. Okay. So, uh, so this is the second part of uh, lecture two. Right, so you may have noticed that as I've gone along, I've always said what we couldn't do at, at a various, various different stages, which has been, is, you know, it's a, it's a way to, to figure out where to go next. And um, uh, many of those lists include can't deal with noisy 
data, right? Which is a bit shameful because all of the all the ILP systems back to the 1990s have been able to deal with noisy data. Um, so in this task, uh, which the, the paper came out um, this year in the Machine Learning Journal, we decided to make it really hard on ourselves uh, because I had read, I, I don't know if anybody here has read something called the Master Algorithm by Pedro Domingos. Anybody read that? Uh, which is, uh, basically is written a couple of years ago and it gives a survey of machine learning and the things that some systems, some approaches are good and bad at. And one of the sentences in there that struck me as irritating was, he said, in the next 100 years, um, uh, inductive logic programming is never going to be able to deal with, with images, right? Uh, because, you know, this is something that neural nets are great at and that logic is hopeless at, right? So I thought, okay, let's try that. <laughs> Right, so this is all about how to learn from noisy images, right? Using inductive logic programming. Or using meta-interpretive learning in particular. So this is paper, uh, uh, oh sorry, this is the wrong paper. Uh, apologies, I'll need to fix that. Um, so the paper is called Meta-Interpretive Learning from Noisy Images. Um, and I'd better check that I've, given you the right paper in the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll fix it. It's on the website that I told you. I'll, pu I'll put the right one there. The motivation is, uh, first of all, we think vision is an interesting problem. Uh, secondly, uh, it's particularly interesting both in scientific settings that we wanted to look at and uh, also in uh, problems involving, for instance, robots and so on. Um, but when we look at scientific data, let, let's, let's, so for, for instance here, this picture of the moon, right? The thing that, in, the thing that I had been wondering about um, that I'd read recently at that time uh, was um, something written by Galileo back in 1610 when he had made the first observations ever of the surface of the moon, right? Uh, through a telescope that uh, he had uh, uh, designed to his own specifications, he saw the moon and he started describing things which went way beyond what anybody else previously had thought of because they didn't see it as clearly as he did. But to begin with, he pointed out, for instance, that the moon had jagged edges, which meant it wasn't a perfect sphere, and uh, it must have mountains, therefore, because it's a real object. And not only that, but the mountains were weird on the moon because they didn't just, they weren't concave, they were actually had convexities because some of those mountains were actually pitted. They were what he didn't have the term for, craters, right? Um, but he describes exactly their geometry. Now, what amazed me is how did he figure all of that out just by looking through this thing? Nobody had actually seen such a thing before, but he was, pretty, he was well educated and he also was very scientifically oriented and he figured it out from shadows. If you look at the description carefully, he understood what was happening in large part by inference of the shadows. So when we see this crescent moon here, it was obvious to Galileo that there's a light source somewhere, right? And that light source was also obvious to him. It was the sun, right? And part of his thesis that he was trying to show is that the sun is at the center of everything. So even if you can't see it, it's still there shining on the moon when you look at it, right? And we don't see a sun in this picture, but we, we don't need to because if we have just a little bit of background knowledge about how light works, we know that something must be lighting that thing up and not lighting the other part of it up. So even if it's spherical, there's something that we can infer about the shape of the object uh, and its convexity and so on. And the theory behind that, which is, should be learnable, should be fairly straightforward. When you have a light source and it bounces off a convex object like that, then the side that is closest to the light source is the side is, is the bright part. If this is concave, then the light source 
lights up the other side of the object. Okay? So, um, and this produces certain strange effects. I don't know, so these four uh, things down, these four shapes here, I think most people will interpret those visually as being either concave or convex. I don't know, does anybody want to hazard a guess here as to uh, whether this one in the lower left-hand corner is concave or convex? It's convex. Now that's interesting, because if you looked closely at what I've just told you, you'd realize you've, there's another interpretation of that. It is convex in the situation that the light source is above it. It is concave if the light source is below. So you're assuming that the light source is above. And that's not surprising because the whole of humanity assumes light comes from above. We just have it built into us, right? <laughs> so, so what about this one here, right? On the same basis, what is this? We know it's the moon, right? So it's concave, it's, it's convex. But we also know, as Galileo did, that light could come from below, right? In which case, it could be, uh, 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 it, it could be concave rather than, con it could be, the natural interpretation would be to say it's concave if you were using our built-in assumptions as you did there. But it would be, uh, it wouldn't correspond with, the, uh, with what we know about the moon. Um, these kind of minimal ideas about light and the movement of a single particle that I'm showing here can actually inform you what's going on in other cases in vision. So for, for instance here, we have a ball, not the moon. Right? We have some shadow pattern. Actually, the light must be coming from above there, in which case it must be concave. We also have a ball there, but we can't see all of it. Why can't we see all of it? Because the light is not reaching us, so there's something obstructing us, but, okay? And all of those things can be logically inferred if we had the axioms to do it, and we do this every day. But machine vision doesn't, right? Machine vision does all of these recognition tasks without a theory of light. And if you think about how absurd that is, that every picture involves reflection and light and photons, and yet we're just assuming, for some reason, in the whole area of computer vision, that this is just an array which has some properties. It makes a nonsense of what's actually happening. We, all the time, figure out that when you have glass, a, a, a glass of water and we can see through it, and you put your finger behind it and your finger looks bent, that there's something going on with light that tells you that, right? So at least having a theory of light is essential, I would claim, to doing machine vision better. And it can be done within an ILP setting, right? So ILP actually has an advantage as a machine vision approach. We're going to try and do this using the meta-interpretive learning approach, which I've already shown you. Um, but the first problem that we hit is that we're going to have noise in our data. Metagol the reason we didn't deal with noise is it was, it's, quite, it's harder than other machine learning algorithms to get to, to handle noise because it carries out consistent construction from the examples. So it has to assume the examples are correct. So the way that we found around this uh, that we've applied is that you, you sample the examples that you're given. You find small samples of examples and you do it repeatedly and you build models from those under the assumption that they are noise-free. Now, if you take enough samples and you test out of sample on those, then you can get some, some of those samples which will have high out, out of sample prediction within the training set. Um, and then by optimizing over that, you can, you can get around noise. Okay, so this is maybe a, complica a slightly complicated way, but it meant that Metagol can be used in the pure kind of logical sense using subsampling and still getting, getting consistent noise tolerant uh, solutions to the learning. There are other problems involved in, in understanding an uh, object. In particular, we need to have, um, we need to build models of the 
uh, of some kind of the surface. So this is equivalent to the issue uh, in the string transformation problem of having to have primitives of some kind. When we started this work, we started with one primitive, which was the notion of a point. Okay, so this, the idea for this came from Euclid, right? Euclid looked at vision type problems, but he looked at them as geometric, and he started by saying, well, there are these things in the world called points, and then we can make our objects out of these, we'll make lines out of points which, have got, uh, which are connected together, and then we'll build uh, other shapes out of lines, etc. So we've tried to take a purely kind of Euclidean approach to this. In some case, though, we, we realized that the objects that we were dealing with would be de better dealt with by elliptical models. And then that's what we're doing in this case. So we're saying we take in various different high contrast points that are sampled from the image, the red points. We, um, we connect those together uh, using lines, and then uh, afterwards we take those in order to formulate a, an ellipse model. The ellipse model in this case gives us errors because the point here, if this ellipse was correct, should be a high contrast point. So we resample and we find another point which then gets a better, uh, uh, a better fit. So again, the, uh, the identification of the sub-objects here is being done at a lower level, below the meta-interpretive learner, by uh, hypothesis formation and active learning, effectively, here. Okay, so is that good enough to deal with moons and uh, micro microbial slides? Okay, so these were the two scientific tasks we had, and indeed it was. So we could find uh, elliptical models uh, that worked for the moon and for, uh, the, uh, for some of these microscopic uh, single cellular organisms. And we carried out a learning task in which, uh, in this case, we were trying to train uh, the learning to decide where the sun is. Okay, you show pictures of the moon and you say, where's the sun, right? So it's a very weird question from a machine learning point of view because, or even from a, from a vision point of view, because the sun is not there. It's not in the picture, right? So how are you asking me where the sun is because it's not there? Okay, so the answer has to be somewhere outside the picture. Uh, and we then uh, are give it a label to say which uh, compass direction uh, it, it should indicate in the training examples and then test it on the test examples. Similarly, there are light sources here. We can identify those uh, with the micrographs. And here is the experiment. Um, uh, in these experiments, we did very low sample uh, cases in which we were learning uh, from, uh, uh, from one or two examples, uh, uh, and we got high levels of accuracy in our meta-interpretive learning uh, uh, of both the moons and the protists uh, compared to some other stat more, uh, well, state-of-the-art uh, mach uh, machine vision uh, tasks. And then we moved through to this problem, which is the one I was talking about right at the beginning. So again, I'm going to ask uh, you now, you should be better informed, which of these two is the crater? So hands up for this is the crater. Crater, and hands up for this is the crater. You think this is the crater? Uh, well, they're both the same image. Okay, One, they, one's upside down, right? They're identical images. Just turn the sl whole slide around and you'll find that it's the same image again. So a lot more people thought this was the crater than that one. That's because the light's coming from the top, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so how, how can we treat this as a logic learning problem, okay? And uh, so what we did is we, we produced a model uh, where we were trying to do, uh, we were trying to do the, we, we tried to get it to, we used meta-interpretive learning, meta rules that were rich enough for it to invent a, a theory of light. So we had at least the base and the, re, the recurrent rules. And then we gave it basic examples and some, background, so some small uh, background facts 
and it came up with hypotheses. And in this case, uh, it came up with multiple hypotheses. Okay, so it said, this could be the solution, right? The light source is we'll call light. The light source angle is from the south, right? And the, and the object is convex. If you make a different assumption about where the light source, if, if it comes from the north, then the object is concave. So for the same image, it's not giving a single classification. It's saying, under these circumstances, this is the answer. Under these circumstances, that is the answer. Now, from a logical perspective, that's the right answer, right? That's what machine vision should be telling you, right? It depends on what you're assuming. But uh, standard forms of machine learning are set up just to give you a classification, which is one thing, right? This is saying, no, it's lots of things, right? It's all these possibilities. This is the way that, that, the, that the background knowledge will allow you to interpret what's going on. We did, we did other uh, experiments with robots. Again, trying to mix this with um, some work in machine vision. We had a vision, uh, computer vision per person working with us. Uh, and she identified this approach of super pixel. So you can take a, uh, an image and you can break it up into uh, low variance sub areas and you can treat these as objects with relationships between them and then we use that as the set of objects in the learning task identifying various different relationships between them and then get it to learn relational rules that say where the uh, ball is in each case so we were able to, to, to get it to do that and again we did a comparison um, against a cart learner using that same information and uh, learning from one or two negative examples randomly selected uh, and we outperformed cart which is a pretty powerful uh, propositional learning algorithm uh, by using the relational learning uh, and we again we learn from smaller numbers of examples we get to higher accuracy faster oh that's a log scale at the bottom there yeah number of training images. Okay, so, um, so the summary from this is, ah, Pedro Dominguez is wrong. You can do logic-based learning from images. Uh, deals, uh, we can deal with classification noise, and that was one of the uh, kind of technological advantage, advances here. We, can, we use some degree of active learning, though it would be nice to incorporate that better into the whole setup. Uh, and to some degree, uh, we can do pr uh, efficient problem decomposition as part of the problem. Okay, so. There was a mixture of predicate invent. I mean, most, almost all of the predicates were invented. I didn't show you all of the definitions, so. Uh, Um, concavity was part, oh, sorry, no, concave convex was invented. So there were two stages to the learning. The first stage was learning on this prediction task. Uh, and then there was an, a predicate that was invented that it was equivalent to concavity. And in the, in the second stage where we evaluated, in the paper, if you read it, we evaluated this task of telling where the, um, which were concave and which were not. Then we provided information uh, simply about what was going on, and it used those uh, the predicate symbols, which we'd renamed here, so that they're readable. Uh, it introduced those. Hi. A picture of a penguin. A painting. Um, so, uh, it, uh, so it wouldn't handle that. Um, well, it's so, okay. It depends what the painting was about. And there's, there are limitations to the underlying uh, primitives that we've got here, right? So if the painting uh, was Mondrian painting with lots of straight lines, it would probably tell you um, something about the structure of that, particularly if you were giving positive and negative examples of certain types of Mondrian painting. Okay, but if it's, I don't know, the, the picture of the 
girl with a uh, pearl earring, then it might identify the earring and so on because it's got this eclipse identifier and it might be able to use that in order to make predictions. So it's only as good as the primitives that you give it to begin with, uh, which is, we, we think uh, that there may be um, a very strong set of primitives that you could use in a lot of different tasks. Um, and at least in some of these, uh, there's some evidence of that because you know micrographs and pictures of the moon are not the same source that's being provided. But there is, in common with both of those, uh, there are light sources, right? So if what you're trying to do is identify things about light sources, you can learn from micrographs and apply it to the moon or vi vice versa. Um, every, every time we do experiments and publish papers, we put the version that we, that we use onto the website. So anybody can use what we've got. We provide the data and so on. To say, is it in development? Yes, it is, because its research is continuously being changed. <laughs> We're producing research vehicles for, for carrying out these experiments. But they tend to build one on top of another. So there's some, something of an upward compatibility in it. Okay, so right, so now this is the last uh, section uh, which is on stochastic logic programs and Bayesian matter interpretive learning. Okay, so uh, stochastic logic programs are have been around for some time, this is from mid 1990s, 1995. Uh, Bayesian meta-interpretive learning uh, is from about 2014. Okay, so uh, the, key, the thing that's in common here, because they're both dependent on each other, is the use of probabilities in, within the learning. Okay, so uh, here are the papers for the lecture. Um, the key idea here is the notion of providing a Bayesian prior over the hypothesis space. Um, and if you imagine such a Bayesian prior, suppose you've got an infinite hypothesis space and you decide to order all of the hypotheses in descending order of probability over the hypothesis space, then you're going to get some kind of uh, curve over those. Um, and uh, the, the, the bounding curves that you consider have to be probability distributions in this case. Okay. So they should, I mean, if they're continuous, then they should be Cauchy. Right, so how do you go about setting up a distribution function uh, over a structured object of this kind? Well, let's start by thinking about probability distributions over strings, okay? One way to define a probability distribution over a set of strings is to define a stochastic automaton, right? So uh, stochastic automaton is simply an automaton, has a set of states, um, which are, let's say these are acceptor states, uh, and uh, so uh, and there are transitions which have associated probabilities. So when you're in state zero, you can take a chart with probability 0.4, you can either um, accept or emit an A, um, uh, and then in state zero, you, with probability 0.6, you can emit a B. So the assumption with a stochastic automaton is that for the outgoing arcs, the probability is sum to one. So, uh, so this is a, a stochastic automaton, and we can take a particular string like A, B, B, C, and figure out that the, that the probability of that, since we can treat the derivation of the string as a Markov chain, we just take the product of these, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, so it gives about 0 0.05. And it's easy to prove that with a stochastic automaton, when we sum over the uh, set of strings, uh, then the overall probability is one, because if you draw, draw, it, draw out the, uh, the graph, uh, then all of, all of the subgraphs sum to one. So, so this, is, uh, this, is, this is a way of thinking of how to do uh, such a definition over the set of strings. But uh, strings don't necessar aren't necessarily the way that you would like to describe 
say, a logical hypothesis space. So, um, uh, but we can uh, represent a stochastic, the equivalent of stochastic automaton as a, as a grammar. So here are a set of production rules that have exactly the same, uh, accept exactly the same distribution over strings. Uh, each one of these production rules simply represents one of the arcs in the automata that I just showed you. And similarly, you can go from there to re-expressing that same uh, grammar as a logic program, uh, as a DNF logic program in much the way that I mentioned in, previous, in the previous talk in part one. But here, we're, say, we're associating probabilities like 0.4 and 0.6 with individual clauses, right? So how, how do we read this logic uh, program? Uh, well, the easiest way to read it is a, as an automaton, that it, there's a certain, if you look at the derivations of the logic program, then they are Markovian. So when I try to prove the string AABB or whatever, I have to take a, a, a set of, of, uh, of, of choices through the, the selection uh, uh, of an SLD resolution in order, to, uh, in order to derive that string. Um, so since we can do this with, uh, we, we, can, we can build a logic program of this kind, we can then ask the question, well, this doesn't just have to be strings. This could be, we could have here uh, arbitrary logic programs, okay? So instead of something that looks like a DNF formula, like these ones, we could just put anything that you like. You could put quicksort there, you could put anything that you like, or the, the definitions of family de, uh, families that I showed you earlier, or the description of a chessboard, and allow yourself to randomly choose chessboards, okay, with uh, associated pieces in places. So this is, in a way, a nice way of setting up a structural prior. And this is a point that was made by James Cousins first, I think, which was, you can define a way, a, a way of, of, uh, of look, uh, of, you can define a prior over, say, Bayesian networks by defining a Bayesian network as a logic program. So define the class of, of Bayesian networks as logic programs, and then associate probabilities with those. You've now got um, uh, an, an SLP generator over the structure of Bayesian networks. Okay, so it's not the probabilities associated with um, the conditional probability tables of the, of the network, it's rather the structure of the object that can be generated. You can define a, 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 a prior over, over graphs rather than a prior over strings, uh, as we're doing here. Okay, so there's, that's a nice idea, but when James uh, described that to me, I immediately thought, well, why not describe a prior overall logic programs in that, in that way. And this is now the entry point to the next idea uh, in this line, which is, um, I've told you what a meta-interpretive learner is. Uh, there's also a notion uh, of refinement. Remember I told you about refinement graphs and this idea of refining programs. There's uh, a notion of stochastic refinement where instead of uh, systematically following the various different ways of refining a logic program, you do that by random sampling. Okay, so if you random sample from the refinement graph over all logic programs, what you will pull out is a randomly chosen logic program. So, we've now got an interesting idea. Refinement uh, generate, uh, are, are generated by, uh, meta uh, by a meta-interpretive learner, what if we took the meta-interpretive learner and treated it as a stochastic logic program, right? So when we give a, a set of examples to the learner, it will generate a consistent hypothesis. When it has to make a choice, it'll do so randomly, okay? So you'll randomly sample from the set of consistent hypotheses in the space. Only consistent hypotheses can be generated by the meta-interpretive learner, and in Bayesian terms, that's called a Gibbs learner, right? So we can use this idea in order to generate a Gibbs learner that will be able to identify consistent hypotheses and randomly sample from that space. 
Uh, in the example that I've shown here, we're randomly choosing um, uh, solutions, for instance, to parity. So you're learning a, a finite state acceptor uh, as a logic program. And you're doing so using the, by identifying the delta rules. So you might say, so what? Why would we want to sample consistent hypotheses from a space? Um, and uh, I won't tell you that immediately. I'll just set up the, the framework. What does it actually say? Well, we've got meta rules. We've got stochastic refinement. Refinement is uh, Shapiro's idea. But here, instead of uh, coming up with individual clauses, we associate clauses with probabilities. We use that to define a consistent prior. Using that prior, we can define a likelihood function, a one zero function for a given ex uh, set of examples with respect to background knowledge. And we can then normalize uh, a posterior. So with a normalizing constant here, using Bayes' formula, we can, we can take the likelihood versus the prior with respect to the background knowledge to give us a posterior probability. So we can def we've got a Bayesian framework that we can apply to this setting that I've just described where we do stochastic refinements using a meta-interpretive learner identified as a stochastic logic program. Okay, so where does that take us? Okay, which stochastic logic program were we using? As I said, the meta-interpretive learner. It's exactly the same one as I showed you before with the abduction and so on. It's just that when you call, when you have, look at this top level, these two clauses here have probabilities associated with them. And there are also probabilities lower down in the selection rule for the meta rules, which meta rules you're going to choose. So everything uh, is a stochastic logic program uh, as part of this definition. Right, which meta rules? Well, suppose we're doing uh, finite state acceptors. These, these are a set of meta rules that work. We're using dyadic learning. Here are other meta rules that, that work. So everything is as it was. Um, in, in the meta-interpretive learning setting. So what do we want to do with this? We can now sample consistent hypotheses given a set of examples, and we can calculate the associated posterior probability by, uh, uh, by, do, by doing products over Markov chains. What can we do that's interesting out of that? Well, actually, there's a number of different things. So one of them is to... Uh, is to look at uh, Bayes, Bayesian prediction. Okay, so there's a number of um, there's a number of uh, proofs in the literature uh, going back to the 90s, showing that the best machine learner is actually the one which does model averaging. By model averaging, I mean it considers the entire hypothesis space, and uh, as, when making a prediction. It weights that prediction according to the posterior probability predictions of each of the consistent hypotheses. We can generate the consistent hypotheses. We can generate their associated posteriors. So we could approximate this, uh, this uh, uh, Bayes, uh, uh, this, uh, Bayes prediction algorithm, which is supposed to give the highest predictive accuracy of any machine learning algorithm. Right, so, uh, so we can do that. And then the question is, how do we do the sampling over, uh, over the space of derivations? So we found two different ways of doing that sampling. One is sample with replacement, a standard approach, you know, statistical approach to, uh, to sampling from a set. Um, or without replacement. Now, you might wonder, well, why do it without replacement? This, most of statistics is based on with replacement learning. Well, we implemented the with replacement one first, then we found that it was oversampling. It was finding hundreds or thousands of identical solutions, right? And those were especially associated with the hypotheses that had highest probability. That's a lot of wasted time, right? So if we could simply calculate the probability associated, we, we don't need to re-estimate again and again. So what about simply doing it without replacement? Now we've got the issue, how do you do sampling from a derivation space 
without replacement. Well, there's got to be some kind of bookkeeping involved in order to do it without replacement. It's not straightforward, but we do, do have a way of doing that. And the comparator that we wanted to do for our experiments was a map learner, which simply gives the maximum posterior probabilities. So this is the one that has highest probability. So you can think of, um, you can think of the uh, Metagol solutions as typically being of this kind. If you assume an Occamus prior, Metagol provides the smallest uh, uh, solution with the fewest clauses if you just do it in the standard way. And that would actually be most strongly associated, that would be uh, identified as the maximum posterior uh, solution. So how do we do the without replacement approach? Okay, so now you have to consider that we've set up the stochastic logic program in such a way that each of the derivations from a particular point, the subtrees have equal probabilities. Okay, so let's show you the sigma function with equal probabilities. And now consider the entire hypothesis space, okay? Maybe even an infinite hypothesis space, but imagine the cumulative probability uh, across that hypothesis space uh, from left to right as you move through the hypothesis space. So this interval here is where you've got the ones that have a cumulative probability up to 0 0.1, then up to 0 0.2, et cetera. When you get to here, you've covered half of the probability volume of the entire space. And at the end, you've got the prob cumulative probability of one, which is the entire space. Now we say, um, I'm going to, what I'm wanting to do is I'm wanting to sample without replacement, and I'm wanting to do that in an even way, right? So, uh, so in this case, what, what one way of doing that is something called regular sampling, right? Reg what regular sampling does is that instead of being completely random, you choose a target probability like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, et cetera, and you sample the point at that space, right? So this is a particular hypothesis, which is the one that's the last one to get the cumulative probability 0.1 or, or closest to that, 0.2, et cetera. The effect of that is that you spread your search of the hypothesis space out over the entire hypothesis space and evenly spread out in such a way that you could simply move this a little bit and you would get a new spread of equally uh, separated uh, hypotheses in terms of their probability. But how do you do that? How do you identify, for instance, where the 0.4 guy is going to be? Well, then the question is, if we're at that point in the space and it's one third probability under each, then is the hypo that hypothesis, is it going to be under this left-hand branch? Yes, no? No, right? Because the re left-hand branch ends with probability 0 0.333 recurring, right? Is it going to be under the middle branch? Yes, because that goes from, from one-third through to two-thirds, and it's not going to be there, right? So if I've got a target probability, I've got a determinate search to find exactly where in the space that hypothesis is. So we can walk through the refinement graph, walk through the derivation of the logic program to find exactly the hypothesis which has probability associated with the target. And we can change, we can simply go through a selection of target hypotheses to get any number of equally spaced hypotheses out of that, and we will never repeat, right? So we're getting sampling without replacement in, by using regular sampling, and it's very efficient because we, can, we simply drop down through the hypothesis space in a guided way to find each, hypothesis, each consistent hypothesis. Okay, <clears throat> so we tried this out um, uh, with learning on training examples for uh, for both family uh, examples and for finite state automata. We tried Metabase RS, Metabase MAP, and Metabase uh, SR. You notice that the predictive accuracy, in this case, this is for, uh, this is for the re regular automata. 
Uh, Metabase RS uh, does pretty much the same as Metabase base, base, uh, Metabase map here, maybe slightly better. In the second case in family, it, it outperforms. So this is our Bayes predictor. So the Bayes predictor is supposed to be the best around, and it, it is so, but it's noticeable that its performance increase over other uh, approaches is most accentuated when you have small numbers of examples, right? Using the prior, if it's a good prior, is very valuable, uh, and that's where the Bayesian hit is getting you, when you have small numbers of examples. When you've got large numbers of examples, it pretty much doesn't matter what you use, right? So you're just wasting a lot of time doing all of the sampling and resampling uh, when you have large enough examples. You might as well do something extremely simple, and it's going to converge on consistent hypotheses anyway. But when you only have a small number of examples, it outpaces everything, right? So that's interesting. So Metabase is actually, Metabase RS with, the, um, with our resampling approach is actually performing very well. But if you look at the time that it takes, it takes 10 times longer than, than uh, Metabase map. And that's really only worth it when you have, uh, you're only trying to learn from small numbers of examples. So there's something quite interesting that, was, that we found out from doing this that we couldn't see simply by looking at uh, the, the, 90s, um, uh, the 90s bounds that uh, Hustler, Kearns, and Shapiri had come up with for, uh, for, for, uh, uh, for, for Bayesian uh, prediction. Um, OK, so uh, we carried on that work in the, in the published paper you'll find uh, by looking at something called superimposed uh, logic programs, where instead of just taking uh, the sample and, uh, and, and, and uh, predicting uh, in a Bayes prediction way from it, you build what are called problog programs. These are probabilistic logic programs by superimposing the, uh, the, the solutions that are identical and counting the frequency of of occurrences of the individual uh, clauses. And we found that our, uh, again in tests, our convergence relative to the standard problem was better uh, because uh, we could depend um, on, uh, uh, well, we could, uh, on the convergence, the, the kind of large number convergence uh, theorems in that case. Okay, so. His related work back in 1994, Bayes' prediction is shown to be optimal by Bernardo and Smith. And uh, in Buntine's thesis, uh, he, uh, does, he also uh, suggested that that should be this case. Hausler, Kearns, and Shapiri in 94 showed um, uh, uh, optimum um, upper bounds. Um, they show that, in fact, there's only a factor of two between the map prediction bound and the Bayes prediction bound. Uh, ensemble methods are based on essentially uh, kind of uh, sample-based approach to Bayes prediction, Freund and Shapiri and Zhu and Zhu. Uh, SRL and PILP, um, this is, these are uh, statistical relational learning, uses a different approach and apart from, because our logic programs are still pure logic programs, we're just sampling from them apart from in the case of superimposed logic programs, and then uh, we're actually getting slightly higher uh, accuracies than either of, of these uh, in, uh, in the superimposition approach. So the summary. So uh, SLPs uh, allow you to generalize over stochastic grammars. Um, the Bayesian prior uh, uh, can be, a Bayesian prior can be imp implemented. Uh, using an SLP over a meta-interpreter. Um, if you use that mechanism then to sample, you can get uh, as good an approximation as you like, depending on the sample size as to Bayes' prediction. We see in practice that this outperforms MAP, uh, more so when uh, you've got small numbers of examples than large. 
uh, but there's a cost, okay? So you, you have a, a large slowdown based on the fact that you're needing to repeatedly sample uh, from the space. You can improve that by doing um, sampling without replacement, um, but it's still expensive. Uh, and uh, we're, we had thought that we would be able to build a noise model out of this, but uh, we've done that in other ways since then. Um, but we are looking now at a, in a PhD in the group uh, at active learning uh, using this general approach. So uh, the stochastic logic programs are used uh, in order to produce the sampling mechanism for the meta-interpreter. What we do learn are called superimposed logic programs, which have many of the properties of, of stochastic logic programs, except they've got a better declarative reading, right? A superimposed logic program, you can take the statement of the clause and treat its, pr its probability as the degree, as, the, as, a, uh, as, a, as representing the, um, the proportion of models in the world that are, for which that's true, okay? So it's, it's a degree of uncertainty that's being represented. In a stochastic logic program, the probability is harder to associate with the meaning of the clause. It's, it's to do with a sample frequency. Okay, so SILPs and SLPs look similar in their structure, but actually one represents something quite declarative and the other quite procedural in terms of its uh, mechanism. Uh, it's implicit, so, so what happens is when, when the choices are being made, right, it makes them with equal probability, right? So representing all of the probabilities isn't, isn't really necessary. Um, and in fact, it's better to simply maintain, so at certain points when you've done, a, you've learned, uh, uh, you've, got, you've gone so far in the learning, the, the number of, uh, uh, of choices will either increase or decrease, okay? So as you provide more and more examples, you, you get a changing prior, depending on the choice set. Uh, so having a fixed probability for all of those doesn't make sense, but having them as all equal uh, does. So it's a stochastic logic program in essence, but it's, it's a bit virtual in reality because it's really binding all of those choices uh, to be equal at all points. Uh, that is an interesting question, but I don't, I don't really have a, feel I have a lot to say about it. I mean, I, I can imagine that you could, for instance, try and learn a meta-interpretive learner um, using a meta-interpretive learner, but that's a kind of weird thing to do. Um, I haven't talked uh, in this about work that we have done in uh, using higher order background knowledge. Um, there is a paper on that, and that, that's actually very interesting, and it allows um, a kind of acceleration over the learning, which you don't get otherwise. Um, we're, still, uh, we're still not at the point at which we can learn higher order background knowledge, um, but it would be very valuable to do so because we found, for instance, that uh, by introducing background knowledge that defines a while loop or a for loop or whatever, you, uh, you can search, uh, you get much more compact definitions than you would do otherwise because you don't have to define these recursive and base cases. Um, and uh, other higher order functions of that kind um, uh, produce much better learning, much more effective learning. Um, so we're, we're kind of, we're interested in that, but we don't have a lot to say about it at the moment. Thank you.